actually start recording now. Um, we are recording these, and so the audience primarily is for school board legislative representatives and other interested school directors. So one of the pieces of feedback that I got over the last year was that many ledge reps would like to get engaged with um, the legislative session and bill tracking and all of those things, but they were unable to make our Friday noon time calls, um, but they do have time in the evening. So what we're trying this year is a to do the webinar approach, to have a little bit of visual support for the conversations about bills, and then also to record that and post it to our Ledge Rep web page. So um, the purpose is to uh, provide updates on bills and issues, a summary of the week's activities, and then a preview to the week to come. Um, and then really uh, an ultimate goal is to hopefully empower you and engage all of you to get involved um, in, in ways at your local level. Okay. So with that, I'm going to keep trucking along. Um, I kept this one in here, and so it goes back to that empowerment. So we have, on average, we have a good group of about 20 to 30 folks who are either on the phone or on the webinar. And my ask to you uh, would be, how are you, in partnership with the WASDA Legislative Committee and others, how are you looking to or how are you engaging your colleagues, legislative reps and school directors across your state, across the state or in your region. And so if there are directors um, who are interested in the issues that we might talk about in the webinars, um, please do reach out to them and get them involved. So that, that's my plug for trying to increase our numbers here. So today's focus, um, we will do sort of start first with the the issues and the bills. Um, I have pre-selected a few bills that ha do not yet have hearings, but are of interest to some of you who are regulars um, that we want to be watching. A look ahead to next week, um, and then just the standard resources and key dates. Um, in terms of foundations, we're really going to dig into the education funding proposals and talk about ways um, to continue or to get engaged over the next few weeks with regard to the really dense proposals that we're seeing. If you are new um, and are interested in what we might have done last week, down here you can see we did, uh, we walked through the legislative bill webpage and looked at different tools and resources on that page and we looked at unpacking and understanding bills. Okie doke. All right, so I'm going to jump right in. All of these, so um, I know some of you are new, so just so you are aware, we will, after this webinar, we'll post the recording and we'll also post the PowerPoint presentation as a PowerPoint so that you can utilize the slides if you want, um, put them into your own format, but use the content. Um, or, or just uh, use it with your audience as is. All of these blue underlined pieces are hyperlinks for you to access um, information about these bills. So with that said, I'll just start at the top here. So this week was a busy week, I think, unless you were like in another uh, country or something, you um, probably didn't miss the um, the hearing in Ways and Means on Monday that included the levy lid delay bill, House Bill 1059. There were many school directors and school uh, superintendents, business officers there who testified. I think there were 60 people in that hearing who testified on that bill. Um, actually, yeah, 60 on that bill and 30 on, on the, the Republicans' proposed, proposed um, budget. And so there were a lot of folks in that room. The hearing went till 7 at night. Um, but needless to say, there were a lot of um, opinions about both. And so if you were one of the directors who were here, thank you for coming. Um, 
and, and thank you for continuing to um, keep the pressure on. So what happened with 5607, uh, if you haven't heard, it did go to a very quick executive session the next day. So it was voted out of the Ways and Means Committee on Tuesday, and then it went to the floor of the Senate on Wednesday evening and passed out of the Senate on a party line vote. Just a quick question. Yeah. Um, how is it that uh, 1059 is still languishing in that committee when the only person testifying against it that day was uh, Lee Feeney? Um, can, who, who is that speaking? Oh, this is Alan Wright's White Salmon Valley. Oh, hey, Alan. Okay, um, so basically the, the chair of the committee is the person in charge of setting the calendar for the committees, what's heard in committees and what receives an executive session. So even though a bill receives a hearing, it is never guaranteed an executive session. And so to be honest with you, um, the reason it did not get an executive session was because the chair of the Ways and Means Committee um, has at this point determined that is not necessary. What he would say and what his colleagues would say is that the levy lid is addressed, the delay is addressed in Senate Bill 5607, and therefore that means that House Bill 1059 is unnecessary. We all know that um, it's not as simple as that because we now have budgets in play that will re require negotiations, and I don't think our legislature as a whole body has a track record for coming up with negotiated proposals efficiently and in a timely manner. So that would still warrant House Bill 1059 needing to have action. Um, so one of the things, if you are on the Paramount Duties listserv or other listservs, there are groups that are c continuing to urge their members to keep the pressure on for House Bill 1059 getting a hearing. It will just sit there until, I mean, because it's necessary, uh, because some would argue that it's necessary to implement the budget and or because it's a fiscal related bill, it means that it is not held to the policy bill cutoff, which is February 17th. Its cutoff is a little bit later. So we actually have, remember a long session is like a marathon. In this case, it might be an ultra marathon. And so we're still very early in the process. So it doesn't mean 1059 is dead. It just means that it is sitting there. And um, my guess is that depending on how negotiations go, it will become re-engaged as we get closer to the um, middle of February, later in February. Um, one of the things that came up, if for those of you who didn't watch the hearing, was there have been big questions about what is the real date by which you need to send out, by which you need to have a budget approved and you need to send out notices um, or you need to make a decision about what you're going to do in terms of the levy cliff. And in some collective, collected CBAs in your bargaining agreements, some districts like Seattle are as early, they have to take some sort of action as early as their last board meeting in February. Others have their last board meeting in March. Um, those dates are much earlier than the legis some members of the legislature think. Um, so they have a May 15th date in their mind, um, but in reality, in some cases, because of the language in your CBA, it's earlier. So when you communicate with your policymakers on that bill or on the need to delay the levy um, levy lid for another year, um, being really clear about what is in your agreement and what you are held to with your union is super duper important. We'll, we'll get back to the meat of the budget bills in a minute, but I'm going to keep trucking through here. Um, a, another bill that received a hearing this week um, that addressed, it's a Senate Bill 5505, and it addresses school district liability for student, crim, uh, for school district liability for criminal actions of students um, outside of school district custody, 
and supervision. And basically, it's a it's an attempt, it's a reaction to the court's findings in the NL versus Bethel case that found um, the district that preliminarily found the district liable for a student's criminal behavior off campus. Um, this bill is not meant to overturn or undo or impact necessarily the result of the NL versus Bethel, but it is attempting to close a, um, it's a narrow bill meant to close a precedent that has been set by it. So um, I would encourage you, if you can, um, to take a look at it, take a look at the bill report. Um, so I'll just click on it here so you can see. So down here, you can see, remember last week we walked through the usefulness of bill reports. And so here in the bill report, you can read the background. You can also, um, actually this committee doesn't look like they've done it yet. Um, sometimes they will, at a point in time, they will put a summary of who testified for and against the bill, um, et cetera. Uh, but if you would like to learn more, uh, hit, hit me an email and I will send you sort of an information sheet that we have used with um, other districts who want to communicate about it. Um, it's, it. It needs to be scheduled for an executive session, and this one probably would be before, oops, before the um, cutoff of February 17th. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. A couple of you are interested in tracking student health and nutrition bills. Um, and those bills did receive hearings this week. House Bill 1508 is a comprehensive uh, breakfast after the bill, uh, bill, bell, breakfast after the bell bill. And so I would, I know a couple of you on the call are really engaged in following those types of issues. WASDA in the past historically, when it comes to breakfast after the bell specifically, um, has been either silent or weighed in against it on the premise that many of these programs are unfunded mandates. There is some indication that House Bill 1508 addresses some of the funding challenges that we have historically had issue with. So um, I would be very interested, Jim, I know you're on the webinar and others might be interested. Um, if you have insight or input on that bill, I'd be interested in um, that. The other bill related to student nutrition is House Bill 1551, and that is related to child nutrition facilities and supporting a pilot project or a, a mini grant for facilities on those. In terms of truancy bills, um, there are three bills in play, and these attempt to address some of the challenges that districts were presented with in House Bill 2449 from last year. Um, as with several bills, it's sort of hard to make sense of them all. So this is a comparison that I've put together that shows you some of the differences between the three bills. And essentially, it's a download. Um, Fortunato's bill basically um, releases all of 2449 into discretionary um, decision making by the school district. Um, not many of the stakeholders involved in the statewide Becca task force or others, sort of the truancy champions on the Hill, are not super jazzed about 5563. Um, we did, we testified other in, on 5563 and 5293, which is Darnell's bill. Basically, we've been a part of the Becca um, statewide task force. We have provided input to changes we'd like to see in House Bill 2449. Um, none of the input was based, no, there was no input I received from school districts that said all of it should be discretionary. Um, so we we basically said, you know, here's here's what we um, would like, with a caveat in both cases, that um, it needs to be funded. And so what I can tell you with regard to the truancy bills, 
Darnell and Orwell and a bipartisan group of legislators are working on coming up with a compromise bill and whether or not that bill will be um, tagged on to House Bill 1170 or 5293, it's unclear. Um, but that's that's sort of the update on the truancy bills. So I'm going to pause because I see a couple of questions here in the chat box um, regarding going back up to 5505. Um, and so I will address those. So the basically um, the NL the NL case is not. It went back. It's been kicked back to um, a it'll be going to a jury actually. So if you're interested, you can, I can certainly send you a link, but it did go up to the Supreme Court and then um, it, it was voted out of the Supreme Court on a 5-4 vote. And Barbara Manson had a dissenting opinion that basically said that the implications of the decision by the Supreme Court was that it opens school districts up for any type of lawsuit when it comes to student criminal behavior outside of their custody and care. And so it has the potential to basically render school districts, should you receive a suit under this, um, under this, this uh, ruling, it could render you uninsurable um, just based on the profound impact fiscally it would have. Um, NL, so the question is, what was it based on? Um, it is basically the case um, regarding the student NL um, and Bethel, the school district. And the student it was the victim in a rape uh, incident where the students went off campus um, for, I think it was for lunch, had it was a lunchtime thing. Um, the perpetrator was a known sex offender. Um, and so the question was, does the school dis should the school district have done something um, in that case? And so this bill is not meant to argue the facts of the case. Um, it is meant to address the precedent that the Supreme Court ruling has set for the case. So we had three or four school attorneys at the hearing who have already seen an uptick in their litigations regarding um, school district, I mean, defending school districts for student criminal behavior. Um, so that's, that's what I would say about that. If you're interested in more, I, I'm happy to send you an email um, with a document that we've been using as an overview for that. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to keep trucking through. Um, each morning, part of my job on your behalf is to look at all of the bills that have been introduced. Um, I do want to remind you to please mute your lines. I'm going to actually mute you, um, so that way there isn't any feedback. If you would like to talk, I think there's a way that you can raise your hand, but um, we are recording and I don't want to get feedback. Um, so the bill watch list has been updated as of this morning, um, and these are all the bills that have been introduced to date. So I'm, I'm all the bills that we are tracking that are sort of education issues. So there's probably well over 2,000 bills that have been introduced all in all. And there, um, and now on our bill watch list, I bet we're close to, um, I think we were at 200 last week, I bet we're close to 250 or more. Um, hopefully you're not getting any more echo on the audio, but let me know if you are. So I wanted to just um, clue you in on a few bills uh, that are on the bill watch list because, like I said, with 250, there's a lot to sort through. Um, you should know that this is the first year in a little while that the Senate does have a bill introduced regarding simple majority um, in bond elections. So Senate Bill 5076 and House Bill 1778 are 
both in play. My guess is they're pretty similar. I don't think they're companion bills, um, but they are simple majority in bond elections and it's wide open. Um, Monica Stonier is the sponsor of House Bill 1778. She is a new House member this year, but she served in the House a couple, um, I think, two or three sessions ago. Um, and so she's not new to the whole game in Olympia. She and Mia Gregerson, you might recall Mia, was one of the sponsors of the bill the last couple of years. They are working closely together. Dick Murray is the sponsor, prime sponsor of the other bill in the House, 1779. His bill is a simple majority in bond elections, November only. Um, and then Mark Mullet is a Democrat in the um, in the Senate who's introduced this other bill. None of these bills, I don't think any of them have hearings to right now, um, but those are ones that we are watching. In terms of federal forest revenue deductions, there are now two bills in play. Last week, we only had House Bill 1393 that Jim, Representative Jim Walsh introduced. Um, Senate Bill 5664 was introduced by John Braun this week, um, and we got four sponsors on that. Um, I've communicated in both the House and the Senate with all of the legislators um, who have on aggregate in their legislative district $100,000 or more um, of, trust, of federal forest revenues that are impacted by the um, current deduction that's in law. So the, the, these bills would actually eliminate that deduction and allow the revenue to come back to school districts. So with those, they've both been referred. They are both sitting in the list of bills for the House Appropriations and the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Chances are in the Senate because John Braun is the sponsor. It will get a hearing there. Um, but I just stopped by yesterday to Representative Tim Ormsby's office um, to try to connect with him regarding House Bill 1393 getting a hearing. So I would encourage you, um, I know some of you have quite an impact in your regions. I would really encourage you to reach out to members of the House Appropriations Committee to try to get hearings for that bill. A bill that um, you haven't heard about yet, maybe a couple of you have, but that you likely will be hearing about um, because it's sort of, you know, humans like drama. Um, this bill is a bill that actually strips the State Board of Education um, of many of its accountability and governance roles and has essentially the State Board of Ed advising OSPI. So much of the authority goes back to the OSPI. Um, so it's obviously something that WASDA at the highest level does not support. We have a good representation on the state board. We feel like school directors have a strong conduit for impacting the work of the state board. Um, Tim Garsha, our executive director, and Ben Rarick are actually going to be talking this weekend sort of to find out if either of the bills have play and sort of syncing up our messages on those. And then in terms of student supports, um, last week I mentioned um, a bill related to the Learning Assistance Program, House Bill 1511. Um, that bill, like I shared last week, is likely to receive a hearing in the House Education Committee on February 13th. That is the day that many of you and your school district superintendents will be in Olympia for the uh, WASDA, WASA, WASBO Day on the Hill. Um, so depending on when your appointments are that day, uh, I think a presence in the House Ed Committee um, might be appreciated so that you can share input and testimony on at least that bill. It's likely there will be a slew of bills because that is cutoff week. So they have to be getting in a lot of hearings. A bill that was introduced, um, I think it was introduced today actually, is Senate Bill 5656. And there have been a few sort of um, technical bills introduced over the last few weeks regarding support to homeless students. This bill um, on my quick read, which I truly just scanned it, um, it appears to be a much, much more comprehensive 
and it um, does direct WASDA to do some work with policies and procedures around supporting homeless students, among many, many other things. Um, so that is a bill I think I saw Dave Larson, I know you're on. I know many of you um, are really attentive to this issue. I would love your support in unpacking and analyzing um, some of these bills. Um, and then we've got language access and dual language. These bills received hearings this week, actually. Um, the, the reason I included them on here is because WASDA has had a role and we are asking for a continued role for school directors in the statewide language access advisory. So we have an, a, a model policy and procedure on that. And um, the bill really looks at system change and support at the regional and school district levels. And we think it's important for school directors to be a part of that decision making and advisory role. The dual language bill is not just about more dual language programs. There is a section that um, really resonates with WASDA's legislative position regarding grow your own teachers and addressing some of the teacher shortage issues. So I think, um, I think it's like section four or something of that bill, House Bill 1445, that talks about the grow your own teacher approach and a grant program to support school districts with that. So it certainly is something that we are supportive of. Um, with that, I think, so one thing that I would say, um, actually, if I go back one, is if I know a handful of you are on the call, actually um, have time and interest in digging into bills. I have created a tool to be able to capture your input, and it's a bill analysis. Um, you can see it here on the screen. If you, it's really basic, um, but it really would be helpful for us as staff if you're willing, if um, like Dave, hint, hint, if you're willing to look at 5656 um, to, to sort of group your comments in terms of um, this format, it will help us be a little bit more constructive and proactive in providing input to legislators and staff as the process goes. So I, um, I will post this on the website for you to download as a Word document, um, and I'll also link to it in our webinar. But I just wanted to offer that as something that maybe some of you are interested in partnering with, with us on in terms of completing the bill, a bill report. Okay, so I'm going to, before I go into the hearing schedule for next week, um, are there any comments or questions? And I guess you have to, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, maybe I'm not going to unmute you. Hmm. I guess you have to, um, thanks Dave, um, I guess you have to raise your hand if you want to actually use your voice to speak. Um, so maybe right now, if you just want to type it in, that'd be great as well. Okay, I'm going to keep trucking, and then just please know that you can, um, you can type in a comment or whatnot. So this is, again, the, a reminder on the cutoffs and then a reminder on the process. So basically the cutoff means that it has to get out of the policy committee um, and get in onto the floor um, before February 17th. It actually it gets out of the policy committee, it goes to the fiscal committee, and then it has to be out of its house of origin by March 8th. And so when you look at this, Chamber 1 is the House of Origin, and um, Chamber 2 is the next, the next house, so to speak. So March 8th is where Step 6 on this picture needs to happen. Um, I actually do see a couple questions. So I'm going to just go back. Um, so let's see. We're going to talk in a moment about the education bills. So, um, Aurora, if you can hold your thought on that one. Um, the status of House Bill 1451 and 1445, basically they received a hearing this week. Um, I would have to look, my guess is they are on the schedule 
uh, for next week to be exec out of their committee. It'll either be next week or the week after uh, where Chair Santos will have them voted on in committee. So that's the next step. So I think it may be, they may actually be on the schedule for Thursday. We can look at that in a second. So yeah, so um, Liz, you had the question, which was they would have to get a committee vote and get out of their committee by the 17th. And a committee vote, there's three meetings in a week, so my guess is they'll either leave their committee by um, the 13th or 14th, if not next week. Okay, so I see one more question. 5702. Dave, I'll have to do um, I'll have to do a little research on 5702 um, and get back to you on that one. And what I would actually say, so just so what you can do, so what I'll I'll show you what I would do with that. So this is um, basically what we would do is we would look at where is 5702. And you can see that this bill has been referred. So there are several, this is, I know this is a really big bill. Um, it's referred to Ways and Means. Some would argue, so remember the timeline for bills, fiscal bills um, is a little bit longer. So we have a little bit more time. Um, I have a meeting actually next week with Senator Honeyford. Um, and that will be something we'll obviously be talking about this. So if any of you on the call have a chance to look at this bill, want to provide some input on it, any of the other Senate bills regarding construction, let me know. Um, we are also partnering, this is really exciting, um, we're partnering with an individual um, who used to work for Senate Ways and Means and did capital construction work. And so he'll be advising WASDA um, starting it basically next week, I'm hoping, um, and he knows school construction and facilities inside and out. He has great relationships with uh, senators on both sides of the aisle regarding these. He's basically the ba brain trust in Olympia on these issues. So he will be helping me learn and helping us step into a more assertive role with school construction um, issues. So for now, what I would say is this could be a bill that you look at these sponsors, you look at the members of the Ways and Means Committee, and I've given you a spreadsheet, an Excel workbook that has everybody's emails on a tab. You can send an email to everybody on the committee. Um, you can look for your own legislators that you have relationships with, but that's really how, if they're hearing from the field that a bill needs to get a hearing, that's a great way um, that hopefully encourages that action. So in the last few minutes, I want to jump into um, sharing the status of the bills that are in play regarding, regarding um, education funding. And I'm going to premise it again with a reminder that we received Outside of the, so, so right now we're not really talking about the governor's budget, so I will just say that. We're talking about the active bills that are where we have legislators that have built these proposals and now they have skin in the game regarding the proposals. And so the two bills that are now up for negotiation are the House Bill 1843 and Senate Bill 15, uh, Senate Bill 5607. And those bills, so like I said earlier, the, um, sorry about this, the Senate bill is up for a hearing in the House Appropriations on Monday. It exited the Senate. It did get an amendment that I'll tell you about in a second. And then the House Bill 1843 is also up for a hearing in the same hearing, in the same meeting. So 
one of the things that I know Dan Steele from WASA and us, and I'm guessing many other stakeholder groups have been asked to get the word out to our constituents, to our members, um, to have you be present either physically in Olympia on Monday to share um, insight and input into both of these proposals or to capture that in writing and I'll talk to you about sort of my thinking from a school director perspective about how I can help you with that. Um, so I'm going to, I want to show you the resources here. I'm, I'm not going to unpack the bill um, because we just simply don't have enough time. Um, but what I would tell you that um, Tim, Heidi, Heidi who is our policy and legal director and myself um, and others. So we're part, you know, we're, we're all as an education community trying to make some sense of what exactly, especially the Senate Majority Caucus um, proposal does and the implications of it at the statewide level, but also the implications for local decision making and local governance. And we are analyzing, creating, we have a template basically that we're working with where we take your legislative positions and identify um, sort of strengths and challenges within the proposal and also just remaining questions we have. So there are many questions or um, pieces that we're just unclear about in the, the proposal in, in Senate Bill 5607 that we're trying to work through. So we're working as fast as we can, um, but again, it is early. What I can tell you is that in a meeting this week with Senator Schessler uh, and Representative Schmick and Dye, so they are from the they are from the ninth legislative district in Eastern Washington. So you probably know Mark Schessler is the um, majority caucus, the Senate majority caucus leader. Um, he basically uh, he knows that there are things that need to be fixed and adjusted in their proposal. He also knows, because he's been doing this for a long time, that theirs is a starting point, just like the governor's is a starting point. So if, if you were to think of a spectrum and Governor Inslee's on one side and the majority caucus is on the other, there will be compromise and it will be somewhere in the middle. Um, and so that's and then we've got the Democratic proposal um, as well. So that's probably closer to the middle. And we hear, um, we have been hearing that there will be a House Republican proposal coming out. I don't know the timeline on that. So um, there, there will essentially be from the legislature, not counting the governor, there will essentially be, we're anticipating three proposals and our service to you will be to try to make some sense of those and show you how they line up with your legislative and permanent positions. Um, but like I said, we don't have that for you right now. Um, the question, I did see Rob had a question about the set, would any of them right now satisfy the Supreme Court? Um, there, it, the rhetoric on, I mean, sort of the pundit view on the majority coalition caucus is that based, one of the fundamental things, and I'll just click on it so you can, you can see, uh, one of the fundamental things that it does is that it, un, it, it um, <laughs> first one here, repeals the prototypical allocation model and uses a dip, different approach to funding. So if we were purists and we were to look at what the Supreme Court has used to define basic education, um, we might say we're not sure that it would actually meet the standard of the Supreme Court because they say that basic ed is as defined in the prototypical model. So that's, I mean, I think basically the timeline for the court is that the legislature, once a budget has been passed, has to give a progress report to the court within 30 days of, of that bill being passed. And so I think there's a lot of speculation about what, what would or would not meet the satisfaction of the court. But what, what we're trying to really attend to is what meets the paramount duty. Um, that sort of thing um, for the paramount duty and what's in the Constitution when it says to 
what ha, and what's in our positions. And so um, we're certainly we're spending a lot of time speculating on the court, but I think at the end of the day, it's what can we get to that you at the local level feel super good about um, with regard to the proposal. So what I would say, so that was the summary. So this is a hyperlink. I sent it to you in the email. Um, and then these are spreadsheets that are public. They, are, they were created by Senate caucus staff. Um, and they sh are resources for you. Some of you may have already seen them, but you're able, there, there are three that I gave you. So this first one is alphabetical by district, but it shows the current state funding, projected excess levies, total funding within current law. And then you have the proposed law, the proposed law being Senate Bill 5607. You can see the total funding, and then you can see the difference between the two. And so that middle column is the impacts of what their proposed levy and LEA policy would, how that would impact, um, how that would impact your districts. And so it's alpha by district. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the source document, so I can't sort it by ledge district or anything like that. Um, but that's there for you. Um, the other here would be per student amount. So a lot of the conversation has been, look, you know, we're actually in some cases, so this is still table one, maybe I'm linked, the, oh no, table two is here. Okay, so you can see, for example, this is the current, this is the proposed, and this is the difference. One of the key things to be aware of um, is that, and I'm not sure that it shows up here, but what I would do is um, spend some time with the bill report because I don't think any of you have time, um, or maybe you already have, read through the entire 130 pages now because there was an, uh, oh, that's the wrong bill. <laughs> Um, the 130 pages because there was an amendment. But I would say is what you want to do is go read the substitute Senate bill report. And in this, it gives you a nice, concise summary of the different components. And then it gives you details on that. What I would say and um, what you will see as you read it is that it will quickly become evident to you that their proposal prov uh, sets up an expectation that that $12,500 per student is generated and backfilled by federal funding and other categorical programs. And so it is... Um, it could be concerning when it comes to federal laws around su supplement, not supplant, um, among other things. So what we would ask, I know, so again, going back, well, actually, so I'm going to, I'll do the ask in a minute, sorry. Um, so, so that's the per student funding and taxpayer impacts. This is the spreadsheet you can see that would um, show you essentially this is alphabetical by district, and you can look from the change in funding from the current law, and then you can, that's the funding to school districts, and then you can look at the taxpayer impact based on the move, move from the current levy tax rates in, in districts to the flat rate in starting in 2019. So one thing of note that we have drawn out is that there is a year gap where there is no levy base. And so that um, is sort of concerning as well. So it jumps from basically 2016-17 to 2019. Um, so that is a concerning element as well. In terms of... This takes you to the bill page, I think. And so again, you can look at the summary there. The Democratic Caucus, um, so this is a summary that has been public. Um, there is not a bill report yet because the bill was just introduced 
but in terms of the Democratic caucus funding recommendations, many of you have already seen this. It was the proposal to the Education Funding Task Force, the recommendations. So basically what House Bill 1843 does is it puts these recommendations that you can at your leisure take a look at, it puts those into bill form. And it also, so that's the summary, the cost estimates are high level. So if you have listened to any of the press availability or anything like that, um, one of the big differences in the proposals that we're seeing, so these are the cost recommendations, um, is that the, the Republican proposal goes very much into the weeds, like you can see, of the district by district funding and amounts. And I have to be pretty upfront with you that there has been some discussion about the accuracy of the source data, uh, for example, the poverty rates or other source data that is used to generate the numbers that you see on those spreadsheets. So in the absence of another spreadsheet that uses different source data, those are what you should be using, but do know that there have been some concerns um, expressed about the source data that was used to generate those. Um, yeah, that's what I would say about that. So the next steps with both of these bills is they both have the hearing in House Appropriations on Monday. Um, yeah. It, I would invite you and your superintendents. Um, this is, you know, it's this is a long marathon, and it's sort of like we started out. We're only on mile like five and a half or so, and we started out. We're not pacing ourselves very well. So if you've been to Olympia like every week in the last three weeks, maybe find a friend in the neighboring district to come um, and submit your testimony in person or in writing to me. But if you haven't been here yet, now's the time to, to get down here um, because you will have an audience of an entire committee. Whether they're listening or not is less relevant than being on the record as being present and engaged in the process. Um, you can also like, I, this is a hyperlink and in the weekly written updates I send, I've also sent you a link, but this hyperlink will take you to a spreadsheet that we update on a regular basis because there, we're human, there are some um, room number changes or email changes. Um, hopefully it will open for you. Um, but anyway, it's a spreadsheet that gives you, you can, the tabs at the bottom, you can see, um, I'll show it to you right here. So these tabs at the bottom are the different committees. And you can say, okay, I want to hit an email out to all of the staff of the committee. So whenever you're emailing a committee, it is always good practice to also include staff because staff are the ones that are tasked with making changes in bills. So if you're going to send a mass email, you can send, you can just select all these people. Look at all these wonderful, smart people and copy it, put it in your, put it in your to box and shoot off an email to them. If you just want to send an email to individual legislators, this main tab over here is where you can find their contact information. Um, and I'm not knowing why I can't see their email addresses, but their LA is here as well. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation for, for getting involved there. What I would also say is if you cannot come to Olympia, we had a call last night with our ledge committee, with your ledge committee. Um, so there are two people from each of your director areas in director area two. You guys have four people. I've asked all of them to, um, if they can't come in person, to provide, to pick a piece of the bill. So when you're going through those two proposals, don't get overwhelmed. Pick one thing that you're, that particularly stands out to you and might have either a positive, ideally you'll have some positive feedback and also some constructive input that you can put in writing that I can put into a packet to share with the committee. So I plan to compile as much input 
from you in writing about good things in both of them, because there are actually some good things in both of them, and also some um, things they might need to consider that might be challenging or um, negatively impactful for you in your different communities. So let me know if you're going to come in in person, but if you want to do something in writing, I would just need it by um, actually the end of the day, sometime on Sunday, if you can send it to me, it would be great to have a representation from districts all over the state. Um, and if you're on the webinar and you're not a school director, um, if you're from a district office, please absolutely you're welcome to send me something as well. So um, know that we're trying to be representative of as much of the field as we can be. Okie doke, um, questions or comments before I move on? Uh, there was a question about which bill had the doubts about the poverty data. It was the Senate bill. So the Senate bill um, utilized census data on poverty and not free and reduced price lunch data. So the census data um, is one example where um, it is inclusive of all children, uh, whether they're in public school or private school, um, and that's one example of that. So it was the, the, Senate, the Senate bill. Honestly, um, the House bill doesn't go into the level of detail that the Senate bill does in terms of the funding formulas. Um, so it's, it's a little harder to, prov to do an apples to apples comparison there. I'm actually, Rob, your question, so Rob had a question um, about the Senate bill matching the data used for Title I. Um, I'm not actually certain that it does, um, but we can, we can definitely find that out. Um, so with that, I would remind you that, um, I think it's on this slide, the time for the House Appropriations is Monday at 3.30, Monday the 6th of February at 3.30 sharp. And um, if you have never been to Olympia and never testified, you can, um, you know how to get a hold of me. I've, you've got my cell number and my email. I'm happy to meet you in front of the hearing room and help you get signed in or whatever. Um, if I can guarantee you, number one, the house hearing rooms are smaller. So there will likely, if there are a lot of people, there will be an overflow room. But um, if you're planning to come in person, come prepared with 90 seconds worth of testimony. So you'll, I would say definitely less than two minutes, um, but 90 seconds is what they limited us to last week. Um, so I would not be surprised if they limit it this coming week as well. Okay, so with that, I know we're a little over time, but I just wanted to do a couple of reminders. Um, the Legislative Conference will actually see you almost a week from now um, here in Olympia, and we're excited to say we have confirmed the governor will be here. We'll have, um, we have confirmed that Linda Shaw from the Seattle Times will be here to MC the panel um, discussion that actually I think will be quite timely when it comes to navigating discussions with your legislators on Monday. Um, Monday the 13th. So I'm, we've got Tom Ahern who will be able to speak to some of the questions about McCleary and speculation about the, the courts, um, where they might go with this, and um, we'll have the superintendent of public instruction. So I think it'll be a really full, helpful, hopefully helpful, four hours, and then in your caucuses you'll be able to organize for the next day. Um, so that's for next week, and then these are just the standard remember where to find things. Those of you who are on here, you already know all this stuff. Okay, so with that, um, I will stay on for a couple more minutes to see if you have any lingering questions, um, but thanks for coming this week, and hopefully we'll get this whole, um, hopefully it will record well, and we'll be able to get that posted well for you this week, um, and we'll talk to you again next Friday. Thanks, everybody. Take care.